Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Dorothea Dibus. She is Professor of Theoretical Philosophy at Constance University, with a special focus on the philosophy of language and the philosophy of mind. A substantial part of her published work is concerned with the mental phenomenon of memory, which you're going to be focusing on today, but she has also written on various other mental phenomena like imagination, attention, perception, and the emotions. So, Dr. Dibus, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks very much. I, I'm very glad to be here. So I would like to ask you first a general question. Uh, when it comes to the philosophy of mind, could you give us perhaps an overall definition of it and perhaps the kind of questions it's interested in? Yeah, so uh, it's a big question. <laughs> it's not yeah. easy to offer a definition of the philosophy of mind, but I guess um, if you think about it, um, the definition is in the name, right? So basically the philosophy of mind deals with issues to do with our being minded, our having minds, and it tries to do that from a philosophical perspective. So that's what the philosophy of mind does, um, thinking about the mind from a philosophical perspective. But then the question obviously is, uh, what are the specific questions? I suppose, um, well, we can talk about those if you like, but that's my definition for, for a start. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's get then specifically into the philosophy of memory then, because it's one of the areas you focus the most on. So what are the kinds of questions it deals with or the ones you're most interested in? Okay, so the philosophy of memory is, um, I guess, part of the philosophy of mind. Um, it's also probably in some respects part of epistemology. So we're trying to understand um, the nature of memory. So the philosophy of mind deals with all sorts of mental phenomena and memory is one such mental phenomenon. Um, we can remember um, all sorts of things. We can remember, I don't know, um, a UK example is always that the Battle of Hastings took place in 1066, right? So we can remember that. Um, that's what um, psychologists and philosophers often call semantic memories. So we have acquired that fact at some point in the past and we can remember that. Uh, but then I can also remember what I did last Saturday. So I, I can remember the bike ride I went on or something like that. Um, and then I can tell you who I went and where we did go and what it looked like when we'd reached the hill. And I might have all sorts of very vivid um, experiences when I remember that. Um, so that's often, this sort of memory is often called episodic memory in the literature. Uh, and then you can ask how, how do we account for the nature of these kinds of memories? So I've, I've now distinguished between two kinds of memories, episodic memory on the one hand and semantic memory on the other hand. Um, and so these seem to be different kinds of remembering, kind of drastically different really. Um, they all, yeah, so it's all cases are called memories, but it seems that we can distinguish between where different phenomena when we're talking about memories. Um, and then thinking about these different cases of memory, we can still ask how, how can we account for those cases of memory? So usually the literature then focuses on episodic memories and the question is how can we explain um, the nature of episodic memories? What, what actually happens there when we episodically remember a particular past event that, that we witnessed in the past that's part of our own lives as they have occurred so far? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, generally speaking, how do we remember the past? Is that something that uh, the philosophy of memory deals with? Is that a question you're interested in? Yeah, I guess it all depends on what you mean by how. <laughs> I mean, so what sort of answer you want there, right? So I guess there might be uh, all sorts of neurophysiological answers that one could give to that question. And obviously the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of memory, um, doesn't do neurophysiology. So that's sort of how question I can't offer as a philosopher. Um, what, so, so I mean, maybe, maybe should, I should ask you what exactly you're looking for when you're asking how here. But then, I mean, maybe what you do wonder is um, how are we now linked to this past event? So when I remember going on this bike ride last Saturday, um, what exactly what is my link to this past event when I now remember that, right? So I have, say, a visual image of the trees up the hill while I cycle towards the top of the hill and I see the trees at the top of the hill. So I have this viv vivid visual image, a, a as I call it, a recollective, visual recollective memory, an episodic memory of that event. And so how exactly am I who is presently having this 
experience linked with this past event that I am somehow um, relating to in, in having this experience? And that's an interesting question. Um, so there's various ways of thinking about um, the occurrence. So many people think, well, what we have here is a representational state. Um, I find myself in a state that represents a certain past event to me. So it represents trees and a hill and me on a bike moving up the hill or something like that. Uh, and then if you, if you think of um, that occurrence as a representational state, then you want to ask how this representational state is linked with um, the relevant past event. Now, I myself have developed a different account, which is a bit um, um, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> a, bit, a bit unusual, and, and um, I don't know, uh, people, people seem to, at first sight, think that that can't possibly be true. So anyway, so on the account I've tried to develop, we are actually not in a representational state where we remember a past event, but we do stand in um, an experiential relation to the relevant past event. So when I now... Um, vividly remember cycling up that hill on Saturday. Um, this particular past event is um, part of my experience now. That's kind of the view. And that's a bit of a crazy view, but I do still think it's a, a view worth defending and, and worth thinking about further. But in any case, so there are two views that one might develop, well, probably more, but anyway, so I've now sketched two views that one might develop in trying to understand the nature of um, that vivid memory, um, there's one particular vivid memory that I've offered as an example, but then you could think that this applies to all sorts of um, these episodic vivid memories that we have of particular past events. So on one view, um, the present experience is a representational state that is somehow linked with this past particular event. On another view that I've tried to develop in, in my own work, uh, I am currently aware of this past particular event and I stand in a relation to this past particular event. So in some, some way, the past particular event is a constitutive element of my current experience. So these are two views um, that one might offer of the nature of an episodic memory. Mm -hmm. And then obviously there are lots of further questions that one asks straight away, right? So even, I mean, either way, even if one goes with my view, but also if one takes a representationalist view, um, the next question then is, how exactly is this current experience? Um, well, I mean, so, so we do want to say that um, <laughs> somehow there's something neurophysiological going on, somehow there was something going on at the uh, point in time that we are now remembering. Uh, usually people think that in order for us to be said to remember something, what they call, or what Sidney Shoemaker called the previous awareness condition needs to be met. So in order for me to be said to remember, um, say cycling up the hill last Saturday, I need to have witnessed, I need to have been aware of that event at the time. So if that previous awareness condition was not met, people say then really um, the relevant occurrence now shouldn't count as a memory. So in order for me to be said to remember, it's necessary that I witness the relevant event that I'm now um, remembering. Um, and then um, we also, or many people, really feel a strong uh, intuition that there needs to be some sort of causal link between this past witnessing or this past awareness of the relevant event and my current remembering it. And then the question is, um, how is this causal link to be explained? How is this to be spelled out? And one could also ask, uh, why exactly? Uh, is it really true that there has to be a causal link here? Um, but yeah, maybe we'll talk about this uh, in greater detail in a moment. Not sure if you want to go there. Let me stop uh, you for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and let me just ask you another thing. Is remembering the past cognitively different from imagining the future? Right. Um, yeah, again, I guess it kind of depends on what we mean by cognitively different, but I suppose it's two different things going on there. So when I remember a particular past event, I remember something that actually took place. I mean, otherwise it shouldn't count as a memory. I can misremember. I can have memory hallucinations or something. So I can now tell you that last Saturday, I, I don't know, I encountered a pink elephant flying over the tree in front of my house or something like that. That's crazy. And that's obviously that didn't happen. So whatever happens to me right now when I have this experience shouldn't count as a memory. So we assume that memory is factive. That is, when I'm said to remember something, um, then actually 
whatever it is that I am said to remember took place. Um, so having put that, to, you know, um, th that seems, so once we accept that, it seems plausible to accept that when I remember something, uh, there was an actual event of the kind that I'm now remembering, whereas when I'm trying to imagine something, I can imagine anything, right? Um, I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine the pink elephant flying over the tree in front of my house right now. Um, so there's no fact of constraint. And now remind me, so you wanted to think about imagining future events? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes, if, if they are cognitively different from yeah. remembering the past. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So when I now try to imagine future events, again, I think the range of events I can uh, imagine is uh, open, is quite wide open, right? So I can imagine um, something very realistically. I can try to imagine something about my own future life, and I might have an interest in trying to be as realistic as possible in imagining this event in my own future life. So I might try to imagine um, starting to teach again after this winter break next week or something like that. Um, and then imagine encountering my students and how best to help them work through the material that we'll be working through next week. And then I try to imagine as realistically as I possibly can, obviously, because I'm, I'm this imaginary project is meant to help me with something. And so the more realistic I imagine this future event, the, the more helpful this imaginary project will be. Uh, but I could also imagine all sorts of crazy stuff um, for the future. I mean, no one, you know, I can imagine being the queen of France in 20 years or something. I could try that. Um, and that that's possible. That's a possible imaginary project, even though it's highly unlikely for it to happen. Um, so when we imagine future events, there's no fact of the matter as to how things will be from our own perspective, at least. Uh, and also, uh, we're not restricted by um, facts. I mean, we can we can imagine um, already knowing that whatever we are imagining is highly unlikely or indeed impossible to occur in the future. So that seems to be a, an important, uh, what you called it, cognitive difference, I guess, right? So um, the openness of the future from the perspective of the, of the imagining subject um, compared to um, the facticity of the past, as it were, and so remembering past events. Of course, like I said at the beginning, I can imagine all sorts of crazy stuff having happened in the past as well, but then that's a different project. Um, and remembering is factive. So when I remember past events, I'm, I'm bound by how things actually were and what I can remember, what I cannot remember. So I think that's one way of distinction between two. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and how do people deal psychologically with the concept of the past? I mean, I'm not sure if this is a good way of phrasing it, but uh, mm -hmm. how do people position themselves in relation to the past? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, um, I think, yeah, I guess I probably haven't quite got the, the direction of the question yet. So I suppose we can... <laughs> We can orient ourselves towards the past. We can orient ourselves towards the future. We can also be aware of our present <laughs> engagement here. So, um, and then how do we orient ourselves towards the past? Well, I guess we can think about the past, right? Um, uh, we can think about, I don't know, the Battle of Hastings or um, whatever you tell me happened to you 20 years ago, or I tell you the story about my cycling last Saturday or something. Um, so we can um, talk about the past and think about the past together. And then we can also have these episodic memories, as I um, said earlier. And they might be another um, interestingly different way of relating to the past compared to talking and thinking about the past, right? Um, so maybe that's what, what you where you wanted to get at with this question. So and then the question is, what exactly is the difference? Um, and I suppose um, one difference might be that when we do episodically remember the past, we are presented with these particular past events and being presented with these particular past events might um, give us access to particular past events in ways that just thinking about them wouldn't do. So being confronted with a particular past event in experience might be different from um, being confronted with a particular past event simply by being told about it. And then having this episodic memory might um, help me understand what, what the concept of the past is actually about. 
So having that episodic memory might contribute to my understanding of the concept of the past because it gives me access to particular past events in this very specific experiential way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and I understand. Yeah, the, the, the particularly that last bit was the kind of thing I was looking for in uh, when mm -hmm. I asked that question. Mm -hmm. So, and what is the causal theory of memory? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I think we talked about this a bit earlier already. So um, the idea is that when we remember something, um, something needs to be happening now. <laughs> something needs to have happened in the past, and whatever has happened in the past needs to have been witnessed by the subject who is now remembering it and then there has to be some sort of link between whatever happened in the past and between whatever happens now and the causal theory of memory says that that link has to be a causal link and then so martin and deutsche in their very famous paper of remembering um that was published in 1966 but it's still um quoted all over the place now so that paper develops the um, classic point of reference for a causal so that's a causal theory of remembering so basically the idea is there was something that happened in the past it was witnessed by the subject the subject currently has uh, a representation in some sort of representational state and there has to be a causal link between this past witnessing and the present remembering and when these three conditions are met they're all all three of them are necessary and they're jointly sufficient that's the idea and then you might ask, why exactly do we, why exactly might one want to insist that this causal link is necessary? Uh, and then we can tell uh, some sort of science fictional stories about people who suffer from amnesia, where a causal link was there and is then interrupted. And then we, we come to think that whatever happens to them next shouldn't count as memory. And that gives us reason to think that actually a causal link has to be there in order for the relevant mental accounts to count as memory. Now, let me kind of spell this out a bit more. That was a, a very general um, summary of the, the kind of argument. So assume that um, I went on this bike ride on Saturday. I've now told you about it. You know about it. Then tomorrow I'm hit by a car in a serious accident and I, I suffer from a, a complete kind of amnesia. So I can't remember this past my, my cycling on Saturday. I can't remember that anymore. But then you come and visit me in the hospital and you describe this to me again because I've told you about it now. Um, and then on the basis of your descriptions, I form um, vivid mental imagery. And I come to tell you, next time you come to visit, I come to tell you about this bike ride I went on on Saturday. And I also tell you that I have vivid experiences when thinking about it now. Um, so whatever happens there is actually related to this particular past event. It, it, I mean, you know, I experienced it, I went up the hill, then I told you about it, and now you're telling me back. Um, so there is some sort of link between this past event, but we still not want to say that it should count as a memory, right? So that means that we, we want to have some sort of specific link here. Not just any link is going to be enough. But as this example already shows, it's also not quite enough to say that we need to have a causal link because you could rightly argue that what we do have here is a causal link. So I witnessed the event. I went on the spike, right? OK, so then that leads me up to here. Then I tell you about it. So there's a causal link here. And then you tell me back when you come to visit me in a hospital. Um, so it seems that there is some sort of causal link between the past event and my then later coming to report on that event. However, we think that this is not the right causal link because it goes via this detour via you me telling you and then you having to tell me back. So it's not enough for there to be a causal link. We, we also have to say there has to be an appropriate causal link. And then um, much more <laughs> fancy footwork has to be done about what counts as an appropriate causal link. But we can say we are fairly certain, to, um, I guess it's highly likely that we'll agree that the causal link that goes through you um, shouldn't count as the right appropriate causal link. So somehow there's some sort of detour here, a deviant causal chain, as they then say in the literature. And, and we do not want to have deviant causal chains. We want to have some sort of direct causal chain between the relevant past event and the um, actual, the, the current event that should then count as a memory. In order for a current event to count as a memory, we want to have a direct causal link that doesn't have these kind of deviant detour elements in it right but in any case so so there's there's more to be thought about when one tries to develop this causal theory uh in terms of what exactly is this causal link uh going to look like um 
but we do want to have, I mean, so, so the intuition is that we do want to have some sort of causal link because um, say, you now, so I haven't told you about my bike ride on Saturday, but for some strange reason, you just form mental images of me going up a hill, then obviously that shouldn't count as a memory, right? Uh, so, so we do want to have some link between this current experience and the relevant past witnessing of the, the event that's said to be remembered, something like that. Mm -hmm. And what are past directed emotions and what role do they play psychologically? Mm, okay, yeah, so I've, I've written on that uh, a while ago. So basically what I call past directed emotions are emotions that are directed at events that occurred to us, that occurred in the past. So I could now feel sad about, <laughs> I don't know, whatever happened at the Battle of Hastings, um, but then more likely we're thinking about our own lives. So we're not thinking so much about emotions related to historical events that occurred way before we were alive. So um, I might now think about losing a toy when I was five or something like that. And then I might experience various emotions, right? And I might feel sad again, or I might feel slightly amused now, but I remember that I was sad. So um, past directed emotions, I, I talk about autobiographical past directed emotions, uh, and they, they seem quite interesting because the question is, should they count as memories themselves or how are we to understand them? That's why I thought about them. Um, so, when when I have, I mean, this never happened, but let's assume I, I lost a toy when I was five, and then I might now have vivid um, experiential memories of losing that toy. I might remember searching for it and not finding it anywhere, and, and the, the um, place was usually on the shelf being empty or whatever. So I might have all sorts of vivid memories. Um, and then I might also experience sadness now. So if I do experience sadness, that seems to be congruent with the emotion I experienced at the time. And you might think that that current sadness should count as a memory, just as my vivid visual memory of the empty shelf should count as a memory. Um, yeah, but so um, when I thought about that and wrote about that, I came to the conclusion that um, we shouldn't think of these autobiographical past directed emotions as memories themselves. So for various reasons, so sometimes they, they come apart. So when I now remember, if I had ever had, when I now remember losing this toy when I was five, I might feel amused and my current amusement certainly shouldn't count as a memory uh, of anything that happened at the time, because at the time I was totally distraught and certainly not amused. So um, that, is, that sort of um, emotion shouldn't count as a memory. Now you might think, well, but then there are other cases where, I don't know, I remember a breakup now and I'm sad again, and I know that was sad at the time. Um, then you might think, well, now that maybe these sorts of emotions, maybe they should count as memories after all. And then I try to show that even those emotions shouldn't count as memories. And it's got something to do with um, how we treat them epistemologically, how we treat them when we try to um, answer questions about what things were like in the past. Um, so when um, when you ask me, so on that bike ride last Saturday, was anybody wearing a red top? And I might not have paid any attention to what people were wearing who I was cycling around with. And that now I have, I try to bring up a vivid visual memory of that event. And I can tell you on the basis of that vivid visual memory that there was someone wearing an orange top, but there was no one wearing a red top. Okay. Um, so it seems that once you've asked me, I try to bring up a visual memory, and then I try to make a judgment on the basis of that visual memory. We wouldn't do anything like that um, with respect to emotions. So if you ask me, um, on that bike ride, were you happy or not, <laughs> something like that, I wouldn't try to bring up an emotion now and then judge on the basis of that emotion. That's just not how things work um, when we're trying to make judgments about the past. And that's kind of in a nutshell, the, the core idea here. So we treat autobiographical past directed emotions epistemologically differently from how we treat um, memories. Mm -hmm. And that implies that we shouldn't treat autobiographical past directed emotions as memories. So um, instead, we should think of them as emotions that occur currently, 
and uh, responses to the memories that we have. So when I think about losing the toy when I was five, and I vividly remember it, I might now feel sad again, then that might be some sort of empathetic um, attitude towards my own for myself. So I know that this little five-year-old, she was really sad and I'm feeling sad again now, not because this is um, a source of um, great suffering to me now, but rather because I, I empathize with this little five-year-old who's lost her toy. Um, or else I might find, I feel a bit amused, in which case that, that would be more some sort of evaluative response from my current perspective, where I relate to my own former self, um, but evaluating the situation from my present point of view. So uh, for a grown up, the loss of a toy doesn't seem such a tragic thing anymore. Um, but I, I kind of come to understand this five year old from my pe present perspective a bit better in kind of understanding that something happened to her that was really sad for her at the time, but actually might not have been quite as bad as it seemed to her then, that sort of thing. So these um, past directed emotions do play an important role um, because they, they help us to, I mean, often they're related to things that happen to ourselves, but they might also just as well be related to things that happen to others. Um, they help us um, to empathize in, in one risk, I mean, if, when one sort of emotions, the, the sorts of emotions that somehow are congruent with the emotions that were experienced at the time, um, help us to put ourselves into the shoes of the person who had the relevant experience and, and thereby understand things from their own perspective better. And in the other case where the emotion is one that might not be congruent with the emotion that was experienced at the time, um, it's a current response, a current emotional response to how things were at the time from my present point of view um, and thereby helps me to understand what things were like at the time from my present point of view. So either way, both these types of emotional responses are really important for us to understand ourselves as temporally extended human beings. And so they help us well, gain a sense of self in a way. Mm -hmm. And what is the epistemic value of these past directed emotions? Yeah, so if I mean, if you if you mean epistemic value in terms of what sort of knowledge can we gain, I guess I, what I was trying to say earlier is we we don't usually rely on them epistemologically, right? So if if I ask you about any I don't know your first day at university and how you felt, then if you can remember your first day at university now and then. Um, you might also experience certain emotions, but then you're probably not going to rely on these emotions that you experience now in answering my question, right? And that indicates that you won't, in, in trying to answer that question, you won't rely on these emotions that you currently experience, which means that they don't play this direct epistemological role whereby we kind of read off them what things must have been like at the time. They might play some indirect role, right? So you might try to, um, yeah, like I said earlier, you might try to put yourself back into the shoes of that person who arrived um, on campus for the first time or something. And then on that basis, you might find yourself experiencing certain emotions and you might think um, that you're quite good at simulating this past event and that therefore the emotions you experience now might be quite indicative and then you might rely on those emotions in answering my question. But then that would be some sort of inferential, you know, there's a couple of steps that you need to take in order to get to the answer. So if once you say, oh, I felt really curious and elated and a bit anxious or something like that, um, and if you say that on the basis of emotions that you currently experience, you will probably have also relied on this idea that whatever you're doing now is going to be helpful in finding an answer and you trust your uh, ability to simulate the past situation um, well enough to rely on it or something. But you wouldn't immediately just take any emotion you experience now as a starting point in making a judgment about what, what, what things were like emotionally for you at the time. So I think that's, that's the difference. So there are um, emotions that you experience at present, past directed emotions you experience at present, won't be a direct starting point um, in your making judgments about how things were in the past. You might use them in some indirect inferential reasoning type kind of situation, but um, not not like a 
starting point from which you, uh, yeah, you just go as you do with other, uh, with with episodic memories. Mm -hmm. So changing topics a little bit now, uh, are we actively involved in how our own mental lives develop? Mm -hmm. develop? Yeah, okay, so that's changing topics quite drastically. So as in a way that um, my work falls into roughly two parts. I've worked a lot on memory and, and currently I'm working on this other project um, that's called Shaping Our Mental Lives and that does try to uh, think more about whether and if so how we are actively involved in our own mental lives and uh, the answer is yes <laughs> we are actively involved in our own mental lives i think that is kind of obvious even though at first sight it might seem a bit surprising so i think um the way we think about our own mental lives often is as um passive so we think of uh, finding ourselves thinking certain thoughts finding ourselves experiencing certain emotions finding ourselves having certain desires um, all these um, seem to be uh, situations where we're fairly passive. It just happens to us that we find ourselves with a certain thought. It just happens to us that we find ourselves with a certain desire. Um, so one might generalize and one might just think of one's mental life as just something that happens to one. Uh, but I'm trying to say that that is a mis misperception. So um, when you think about simple everyday examples, it seems quite clear that we are actually actively involved in our mental lives. And I often tell this story about uh, someone called her Emma, who comes home at night and feels a bit sad, and then she puts on some music to cheer herself up. So what does she do? Well, she realizes that she doesn't, she feels sad, but she doesn't want to continue feeling sad. And she has some idea as to how she can change that, namely by putting on this cheerful music. So she does, and then she feels better. So what she's doing, it seems, is uh, taking an active part in how her mental life develops. Um, so she was sad, she could have just stayed sad, but she didn't want to stay sad, so she does something and then things change for her and she feels more cheerful. So that seems to be a very simple case in which someone does play an active part in their own mental life. And so if, if only one, if only this one case is uh, convincing to you, then we have thereby shown that at least sometimes in this one particular case, someone is actively involved in their own mental lives. But then, of course, I do think that uh, that's not the only case. So we are actively involved in our mental lives in all sorts of contexts, even if that might not seem the most obvious thing to us at first sight. Mm -hmm. And this connects with the concept of mental self-regulation, correct? Yeah, quite. So. Uh, some of the empirical literature talks about um, emotional self-regulation, and I guess one can then also uh, broaden that concept and talk about mental self-regulation more generally. And, and so the idea is that uh, what Emma does when she comes home and puts on some music to cheer herself up um, is not just a random way of being actively involved in her own mental life, but she rather does something uh, in a goal-directed way. So she, she finds herself being sad and she wants to feel better. So she's not just only somehow actively involved somehow. She, she has a goal and she wants to change things in this particular way. Um, and so I guess that's how we might talk about what we're talking about when we're talking about regulation. So someone is actively involved with a clear goal that is um, successfully pursued. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, but when we say actively here, I mean, do you specifically mean freely? Does this connect in any way to questions about free will, for example? Hmm, yeah, interesting. I mean, I guess if... <laughs> so, I think, I think the suggestion that we are actively involved in our mental lives is as compatible with... Um, all sorts of theories of free will as the claim that we are actively involved in our physical environment is. So if you grant me that I can lift chairs or lift this computer or, you know, do all sorts of these, these simple things in my physical environment, I am actively involved in my physical environment. And then you ask, um, does this presuppose free will? And maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. I'm not sure what your view would be. Um, but I think um, this carries over in just, I mean, whatever you say about the physical case will carry over to the mental case. So I think there's some really interesting differences between how we can be actively involved in our mental lives and how we can actively be involved in 
the physical world in our physical environment. It's not it's not like these are um, the same. But with respect to what does it mean for free will, I think the answer will be the same. So if we think about the physical world, um, I guess I don't know whether you would still want to say even if hard determinism is true, I can be actively involved in the physical world. Maybe you want to say no, but then you will certainly agree. Or I, I don't know, but I guess it's plausible to say um, on compatibilist views, I can still be actively involved in the physical world. And the same would apply um, to the mental case and on libertarian accounts of free will. I can definitely be actively involved in the physical world. And that would also carry over to the mental um, case. So I think. Um, yeah, probably the, the one problem case would be uh, the hard determinist case. And th th I don't know exactly what you would think about the fiscal world, but whatever you say about the fiscal world, I uh, would then carry over to the uh, mental case as well. So, mm -hmm. When trying to understand the mental self-regulation, do you ever try to uh, answer questions like, for example, uh, understanding where it comes from an evolutionary perspective. I mean, if it serves certain specific functions and that would explain why we are able to mentally self-regulate, or is that something that doesn't interest you specifically? Mm, that's interesting. Um, I haven't thought about that much, but I guess uh, particularly when you think about emotional self-regulation, there might be some, some evolutionary story to tell. Um, yeah, it, that's, I don't. So, what would your hunch be? So we learn to regulate emotions in order to survive, that sort of thing. Yeah, that that might be that. Um, but no. So um, my own account is probably just trying to understand what happens when we do do that, being the human beings that we are now. So okay. I can see how evolutionary questions might be interesting, but I haven't really thought about them at all. Um, but there's plenty of stuff to think about, just just trying to uh, account for the nature of the phenomenon as it is um, to be found in human beings as they are now. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, is there anything else you would like to mention about uh, mental self-regulation or the ways we are actively involved in shaping our mental lives? Uh, I mean, what are, what are the other kinds of aspects of it that you explore that you haven't mentioned mm -hmm. yet? Yeah, so maybe we can think a bit more about the difference between being actively involved or regulating our mental lives and regulating uh, the physical world around us. So I don't know, if someone throws a ball and that ball is just about to hit a window, I can catch the ball and thereby avoid um, the window being smashed or something. So you might think of this some sort of regulation of my physical environment. I don't want to have the window being smashed and uh, I catch the ball. Um, and so so there, there are ways in which we are involved in our own physical environment, and then I claim there are ways in which we're actively involved in our mental lives. And, and I think they do differ in quite interesting ways. So when you think about the physical world, so catching a ball, you're directly um, intervening on the ball, right? You catch the ball. And, and you also kind of, you know what's going to happen once you've caught it. It's going to stay there in your hands if you've caught it properly. So whatever you're doing is fairly direct and is also fairly precise. So you can predict and control what you're doing. Um, and I try to argue that in the mental case, uh, things are slightly different. So whatever you're doing will often be indirect. At other times, it'll be imprecise, but it's not often both direct and precise. So when you are actively involved in your own mental life, when you're trying to regulate your own mental life, it's just not like catching a ball. <laughs> so, for example, when you think back to Emma, so what she does when she comes home, she puts on music. So it's not like she, I don't know, <laughs> reaches into her brain and pulls out the emotional sadness. So as the, so that, you know, that that's not how we interact with our own mental lives. So she puts on some music and she knows that when she's done that, that's going to change her mood. So that's a fairly indirect way. Um, to regulate her own emotions. She needs to turn on the machine with which she plays her music, and then she needs to listen to the music, and that in turn, she has good reason to believe will cheer up, and so her emotional state will change. Um, so in that case, what happens is an indirect intervention. So it's not like catching a ball, <laughs> where I said earlier, that's quite direct, right? I just hold on to the ball. Um, we can't just hold on to the emotion and pull it out and replace it, but yeah. uh, instead she puts on the music. 
And then there are the cases like um, when you um, ask yourself what you think about the death penalty and you haven't got a, a decisive view on this, but you want to form a view, you might sit down and think, okay, so let me think about this for half an hour. And you really try to understand what your views are. Um, and then what you do have is, is, in a way, it's quite a direct intervention. So you sit down with a question and you tell yourself, I want to think about this now, and you get your pen and paper and whatever you do. Um, but then in this case, it's kind of imprecise because you don't quite know what's going to happen next, right? So there you just really you have to trust the process. If, if you already knew what was going to happen, you wouldn't have to sit down anymore because then you'd not need to find out, right? So, I mean, this is part of how we um, set up the situation is that you do not yet know and you want to find out what you think about it. So you intervene in a way um, that one might describe as direct, but it's imprecise because you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and so, so generalizing from these two examples a bit, it seems quite plausible that that's in, in the paradigmatic cases where we intervene in our own mental lives, uh, this intervention is either imprecise or indirect, but not both direct and precise. And that in turn is kind of um, interesting because it highlights um, in comparison with the physical case, when we intervene in the physical world, lots of these interventions and I would say the paradigmatic interventions in the physical world, they are just direct and precise. We can just directly intervene on whatever we want to intervene on. We catch the ball and we know what's going to happen, namely the ball is going to stay here and it's not going to smash the window. Um, so intervening on our own mental lives is a bit more complicated in a way. Um, it's more prone to error. It's more um, elusive. Um, so and it's, it's more fragile, right? So the ability to regulate our own mental lives is important and it's important to, I think it's important to highlight that we do have that ability. But then once we start comparing with the fiscal world and interventions in the fiscal world, it also is clear that this ability to regulate our own mental lives is a very um, fragile and elusive um, phenomenon. So we need to be careful and sensitive when we try to, because otherwise we're not going to be able to uh, do it. Mm -hmm. So just before we wrap things up here, would you like to tell us perhaps what are some of the main topics and questions you're working on now at the moment and perhaps the ones you will be interested to explore more in the near future? Mm. Yeah, so I think um, when I think about the philosophy of mind, I mean, my research area, I think the questions that I find most interesting are present and that haven't been given that much attention in the philosophy of mind are questions to do with um, value and ethics. So I think those questions are really interesting to see how issues in the philosophy, philosophy of mind kind of bump up against these axiological and ethical questions. So, um, I've written a paper once uh, on on the value of full attention. That's a while ago. So that was one attempt to link these axiological issues with um, uh, issues in the philosophy of mind. And so now I've, I've thought about the value of um, our ability to engage in mental self-regulation. Um, I'm, I'm working on a paper on, <laughs> on the value of being aware of our environment in perception. So the value of perceptual awareness uh, those sorts of issues, I think they're really interesting. Same applies to memory. So um, I, I'm thinking about um, our ability to learn from the past and the role that memory might play in, in that context. And so if, if you think about you know, the ability of learning from the past as something that has value, then the question is what, what role, how might memory be of value in this whole, uh, in this context? Um, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, let's leave that. Um, yeah, <laughs> as always, like I'm, I'm thinking about all sorts of things, but I think the, these axiological and ethical questions that's that's particularly interesting, and I think that's where philosophers of mind might fruitfully spend some more time um, working. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. just before we go, would you like to mention where can people find your work on the internet? Oh, <laughs> well, I've got a list of my published work on my website, but I haven't got any links there yet. But I hope to I hope to put some links down there soon. So I hope it will be my website before too long. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. okay, so Dr. Dibus, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. It was great fun talking to you too. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. Please also consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description of the interview. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perugo Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Bernardo Seixas, Paulo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Robert Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Pliz, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, and Zachary Fish. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.